Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation. I'm Bill Bush with Horizon Financial Group. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to join us. And then we're going to kick things off with just a little brain teaser before we get started, just to get you thinking a little bit before we dive into the topic. So if you haven't yet thought about these two questions, just take a second and answer them to yourself. So in life, would you rather be early or delayed? in life? Would you rather be early or delayed? And then the second question, would you rather pay a penalty or get a bonus? So just remember your answers. We'll come back to those questions a little bit later. So today we're talking about savvy social security planning, what baby boomers need to know about their retirement income. And you're going to hear me talk a lot about baby boomers today, but really this is good information, whether you happen to be a baby boomer or not. Older Gen Xers, for example, they're going to be making decisions about Social Security in the next 7 to 15 years, so not too early to start putting some thought into it. Now, quickly, just a quick introduction. I've been an advisor here at Horizon Financial Group for just over six years, helping people like yourself plan for a more financially confident future. And those letters that you see by my name, those are designations I have, and they have a lot to do with the work we do on retirement plans. So here at Horizon, we serve as the advisors on about 75 company retirement plans, like 401k plans. Those are scattered throughout the Gulf South, but primarily based in Louisiana. The CRPS stands for Chartered Retirement Plan Specialist, and the CPFA you see there that is the Certified Plan Fiduciary Advisor. So that's what those stand for. And now to the topic at hand. So when your parents retired, they probably didn't think too much about Social Security. Maybe they went down to their local office as soon as they turned 65, or maybe 62 if they retired early, and just applied for benefits. They took their benefits for granted and didn't really ask very many questions. But baby boomers approach the Social Security question in a different way and it's creating a problem for many people. So people are hurting their retirements by making costly, terrible decisions about Social Security. And this is the main challenge we're gonna solve today. But before we do that, just wanna address a couple of things about this presentation. So first you may be wondering, well, you know, why is a financial advisor here to talk about a government program like Social Security? Good question there, and this is the answer. I think that there's a big need for social security education. So boomers and others very interested in the topic, certainly your presence here today indicates that. There are many uninformed people that are making damaging decisions about when and how to claim social security. And then those poor social security decisions make advisors jobs, quite frankly, a little more difficult when we have to help clients develop a retirement income plan to correct for maybe what could be a lower than necessary social security benefit. Okay, I also want to make a couple guarantees here. One, we're just trying to make people smarter about claiming Social Security, and I believe you're going to be better prepared to make a good decision after this presentation. And number two, I assure you there's no selling going on. This is going to be a purely educational event. Now, in order to help you remember everything we've discussed today, we do have a handout that covers the key points of our presentation. We can certainly mail that out to you. It's a nice six-page brochure here. It's going to be also available as a download, as a PDF, in the chat section of the Zoom. We'll remind you about that a little bit later. And with an issue such as Social Security, where really everyone's decision is unique and personal to their own circumstances, we're going to invite folks to come in for what will be a complimentary meeting where we can conduct an analysis for you to help you get an idea of what strategy might fit best into your overall retirement income plan. Again, complimentary, and we'll remind you of that later as well. And one of the last things, just about questions, inevitably, questions are going to come up, and sometimes a lots of them. So in order to get everyone out of here on time, we're not going to take questions during the presentation. As we go along and you have a question, I definitely encourage you to write it down. And the best way, if you have a question, certainly it might be more personal, is to reach out to us via our email that you see here, info at horizonfg.com or line up a meeting if you happen to have an advisor here at Horizon already. We'll give you another reminder of that as well later. But for now, time to dive in. 
So first, a few things to know about Social Security. The first one is you have many claiming options. One couple, believe it or not, conceivably could have up to 18,000 ways to claim, but we normally just look at the five most useful scenarios. And the other thing is your decisions have far-reaching consequences, and most of those decisions are irreversible after 12 months. Your choice, if you're married, can definitely impact, uh, impact both spouses. And Social Security is not bankrupt, and it's not a Ponzi scheme. There's a lot of noise out there about that. We'll address some of that. Certainly, some of your friends and family, they've probably been helped out by Social Security benefits. But at the same time, maybe very few of your friends have any expertise on the subject. And so what they might recommend or what they might do might not necessarily be right for your situation. So here's what we're seeing that baby boomers want to know. Will Social Security be there for you? You've heard about for many years or probably been told that the system is going broke. But now that it's almost time for your turn to collect, is that really true? You'll also want to know, you know, how much can you expect to receive? Before you can retire, you got to know, well, how are you going to support yourself? And that means, you know, doing a budget, lining up all your income sources and knowing how much you can expect to receive from each. Social Security, because it does represent a relative known quantity, it represents kind of the foundation or the base, if you will, of that plan. And so you're probably asking, well, when should I apply for Social Security? You probably heard that if you apply early, your benefit will be lower than if you apply later. That's certainly true. But is it worth missing out on all those extra checks to have a higher benefit later on? We're going to shed some light on that question today as well. And something your, your parents might not have ever asked is, how is it possible to maximize those benefits? There's certainly absolutely nothing wrong with using social security rules to your advantage. And today we're gonna to talk about ways that you can maximize social security benefits simply by knowing the rules and making smart decisions. And then finally, you're wondering if Social Security will be enough to live on in retirement. You probably already know the answer to this. It's a big fat no. You know, Social Security may represent about 40% of the average retiree's total income. So you figure by coordinating Social Security with the rest of your retirement income plan, you hopefully can pursue a comfortable, worry-free retirement. Well, most people tend to minimize the value of Social Security. Some believe that, hey, if they're going to get something back from the system at all, they think it's going to be a minimal amount, not really enough to count on. But we're going to show you that Social Security is far more valuable than most people realize, especially when you look at the lifelong value it can bring over time in retirement. And we're going to show you some examples of that. So will Social Security be there for me? Some people are certainly worried about this, that it won't be around. We hear this quite a bit, you know, it, and this has led to a lot of misunderstandings and certainly some irrational fears about kind of the solvency, if you will, of the system. But let's look now at what the Social Security trustees say. Every year they publish a comprehensive report showing kind of the long range outlook for Social Security. And it was certainly designed as a pay-as-you-go system. Payroll taxes from your current workers go into this trust fund and are immediately paid out to current retirees. Because baby boomers have been in their peak earnings years, the trust fund has accumulated more than needed to pay those current benefits. So right now you see the trust fund actually holds about $2.9 trillion, which is invested in special issue treasure securities. Now, as baby boomers start retiring, the trust fund here is going to kind of actually, it's going to be drawn down. And we're going to see that happen probably by the year 2034. Here you see a chart that kind of explains that over the next 75 years, those costs are certainly going to exceed the income. And there are going to be enough reserves in the system that will be able to pay out 100% of the promised benefits until about the year 2034. Now, after that, if nothing is done to change the system, well, you see the drop off there, the income is going to be sufficient to cover about 79% of the promised benefits in the year 2034. And so the reserves are going to be depleted at that time, but still there's going to be enough being coming in 
to pay out 79% of the promised benefits again by 2034. So going farther out, that estimate reduces to 73% of the promised benefits when you look at maybe the next 70 years or so, unless something is done about it. And there are certainly fixes being discussed. And so let's take a look at what might it take to restore the solvency of the system. Now, although Social Security is not in imminent danger, 2034, still a little ways out, but most people agree the earlier that reforms are instituted, certainly the less painful they're going to be on everyone. And here are just a few of those ideas that have been proposed. So one is to increase the maximum earnings subject to social, the Social Security tax. Now, currently, that's only $142,800 in earnings are subject to the 6.2% tax paid by you and the 6.2% tax paid by your employer. After a person exceeds that 142,800 during the year, they no longer pay that 6.2%. And so that limit could be raised. That's one option. Certainly the 6.2% could be raised as well. The second one you see on here, another reform proposal calls for the raising of the normal retirement age as those life expectancies increase. Currently, full retirement age is 66 for people born between 1943 and 1954, and then 67 for people born 1960 or later. And still another proposal uh, to reform would be kind of changing the benefit formula, the calculation, so that future increases would happen at a slower pace. And this would certainly affect the benefits of future retirees. And then of course, some are talking about changing the formula for cost of living adjustments. And this of course could give retirees a smaller benefit increase going forward. Although the changes there may be expected to be minimal. And so you can learn about some of the social security reform proposals from the American Academy of Actuaries. And they have a website called actuary.org. That's actuary.org, where you can kind of look at some of those. But really the bottom line for baby boomers is that your benefits are not probably gonna be affected by much at all. So you can stop worrying that social security won't be there for you in the future. It'll be there, but we're probably likely to see some legislative changes maybe in the next 10 years to ensure the benefits will be sustainable for a long period of time. So after thinking about that, you might be rightfully saying, okay, well then what is a clearer way to think about social security? Well, here's a straightforward definition. So social security is inflation protected income that you can't outlive. Again, social security, inflation protected income you can't outlive. Those sound great can't outlive it, and inflation protecting. And quite frankly, even after your death, your benefit could continue in the form of survivor benefits, as we'll see in a bit. Now, the premium or tax that you're paying is listed on your paycheck receipt under FICA, which stands for Federal Insurance Contribution Act. And you and your employees have been paying that premium in every paycheck. And so you want to be smart about how and when you collect this earned benefit. So let's look at its various features uh, real quickly. So first, Social Security, one of the few sources of income you can't outlive. If you're worried about running out of your personal assets in old age, uh, you need not have that fear with Social Security because it does continue until you die. And of course, the longer you live, the more you can extract from the system. Here you see if your benefit starts out at $2,000 per month, and if you live 10 more years, you're actually gonna receive nearly $300,000 in lifetime benefits. Uh, 20 more years or so, 600,000. And if you live 30 more years, you'll receive over that time, over $1 million over your lifetime. Now that does assume annual cost of living adjustments or what they call COLAs of about 2.2%. So second, social security offers annual inflation adjustments. So if your benefit started out at that $2,000 per month, and if the annual COLAs, those cost of living adjustments are 2% in 10 years, you'll see your monthly check will now be 2,438 per month. In 20 years, based on those average cost of living uh, increases, so 
2,972. And in 30 years, what was once the 2,000 per month check would become $3,623. Now there is no way of knowing exactly what the future cost of living adjustments are gonna be, but 2% seems reasonable as an estimate. The actual cost of living adjustments are calculated in the fourth quarter of each year and adjusted for the upcoming year. And really because this year we're starting to see a higher inflationary environment, the cost of living adjustment for 2022 benefits may actually be higher than that average 2.2%. So how can I expect to receive? How much can I expect to receive? And let's take a look at that. So this can vary greatly from person to person and truly you know, everyone's situation is unique. So your benefit is going to depend on really a couple of things. And it's going to be based on how much you earned over your working career and the age at which you apply for those benefits. Those are the two main factors that drive your benefit amount, how much you've earned over your career and at the age at which you start receiving the benefits. So what's the math behind all that? Well, the formula for calculating Social Security, it's, it's kind of complex. You may or may not want to follow along with this. Some people kind of find it interesting. And in a moment, I'm going to show you a couple of ways you can kind of estimate your own benefit. The general process kind of goes like this, though. First, Social Security looks at your annual earnings over your entire lifetime. They index them for, for inflation, and then they pick out the highest 35 highest years, those earnings years, and they include it in the formula. So those earnings, those indexed earnings are totaled up, divided by 35 of your annual, they then boil that down to a monthly. But if you don't have 35 years of earnings, those missing years are actually gonna be filled in with zeros. And that of course has the effect of lowering the social security benefits for people that have maybe taken time out of the workforce. Maybe you've had to raise children or something like that. However, some of those folks are gonna be eligible for spousal benefits, which we're gonna cover in a minute. But back to the calculation, the average yearly goes then divided into this monthly, which you see there, the AIME is the average indexed monthly earnings. So Social Security kind of likes abbreviations and acronyms, and that's one of the few important ones. So next, a formula is applied to your AIME, your average index monthly earnings, to determine your PIA, primary insurance amount. This, the PIA, is the amount you will receive when you reach your full retirement age if you file that time, which could be 66, 67, or some age in between, which we'll cover. Each year, the cost of living adjustments are applied to your benefit to help you keep up with the cost of living inflation, the rising cost of goods and services. So those acronyms, again, you see here, AIME, Average Index Monthly Earnings, PIA, Primary Insurance Amount, FRA, Full Retirement Age. Here's an example of how that benefit formula would work for a baby boomer who was born in 1959 and who earned, let's say, the Social Security maximum every year since they were age 22. His average index monthly earnings, or AIME, would work out to be 11,098 bucks. So now we get to a calculation that includes bend points. In calculating the PIA, primary insurance amount, the first $996 is gonna be multiplied by 90%, first bend point right there. The second amount between $996 and $6,002, or $6 which actually comes up to be, you see the math on the side, $5,006 is going to be multiplied by 32%, second bend point. And the amount over that $6,002, which is the remainder here, or $5,096, is going to be multiplied by 15%, third bend point. Then you add up all those and total it out, and you get the PIA of $3,262.72. That would be the amount the worker would receive if they file for benefits at full retirement age. Told you it was complicated, but fortunately, you don't have to figure those uh, numbers out yourself. And you say, well, okay, that's good to know, but you know, why, why shouldn't I claim at 62 instead of delaying full retirement age or, or, or wait? And, you know, that's a good question. Uh, and 
it's also because that's kind of where people start to get in trouble. And, and it's because of this. Your monthly benefit is going to be reduced if you claim early. And by early, we mean claiming before FRA, full retirement age. So social security benefits may also be reduced by taxes and Medicare premiums are going to be deducted. And benefits also could be withheld if you work. So what this means is even when you maximize your claiming strategy and something we're actually glad to help you do, it, the amount you actually could receive could be smaller in reality because of taxes and those Medicare parts of that, as we'll explain a little later. So when should I apply for benefits? Great question. And this, of course, again, is unique for everyone's situation, but there are some factors uh, to, to really decide on and when you get to applying. And here's a few of those right now. The decision really kind of comes to these things. Uh, you know, on the left, health status. So it's certainly important to realize, you know, are you going to be entering retirement at being healthy? Is life expectancy in your favor? That's certainly one. The need for income, you know, what are your other sources? That factors into it. And then if you're a surviving spouse, you have to think about the other person's resources as well. And then the last part you see on the right there, survivor needs, we're going to get, that and get into that in just a minute. But think of those five factors, because those are some of the most important ones on when it becomes deciding when to file. So for most people, Social Security benefits alone will probably not be enough to live on throughout retirement. You know, we, we say this a lot, that it's probably going to replace on average between 35 to 40% of your pre-retirement income and you know, posed another way, could you live off of 35 to 40% of what you earn now? And for most people, certainly not. But here's a closer look at how your claiming age actually impacts your benefits. So FRA, let's talk about that. Full retirement age is the age which you can claim full unreduced benefits. It used to be 65 for everyone. But now we're seeing, of course, the higher full retirement age being phased in as a result of amendments and legislation passed way back in 1983. So for everyone born between 1943 and 1954, FRA, full retirement age is 66. For everyone born in 1960, you see on the bottom, full retirement age is 67. For those born between 1955 and 59, full retirement age is 66 plus you see a couple of number of months, depending on where your age falls. So it's important to know your FRA. And a lot of folks are still kind of under that misconception that Social Security is 65. But depending on when you were born, FRA is either 66, 67, or somewhere in between. Let's leave this slide up just for a second. I'm going to grab a swig of water, but it is important that you know this. Okay, so 66. 67 or somewhere in between. That's FRA. What if you apply for benefits early? This chart kind of shows this. Remember, PIA, primary insurance amount, the benefit you're going to receive at full retirement age. So if you apply for Social Security before FRA, your benefit will be reduced. The, you'll receive a percentage of your PIA depending on when you apply. Look at the second column here. This is if your full retirement age is 66 and you apply at 62, you will receive 75% of your PIA at 63. Next line down, 80% and so on down that column. The third column, column on the right, is if your full retirement age is 67 and you apply at 62, you'll receive 70% of your PIA and on down the list. And these amounts are actually prorated monthly, so you can apply at any time after the age of 62 and your benefit is gonna be reduced by the proper amount. But here you kind of see the yearly ranges. So what if you apply after FRA? On the other hand, if you apply for after the full retirement age, you're going to earn what's called delayed credits and that amounts to 8% for each year you delay. So looking at the second column here, if your full retirement age is 66 and you apply at 67, your benefit now becomes 108% of your PIA. You get an 8% delayed credit. At 68, it's 116% and so on. After age 70, you can't earn any more delayed credits. So it really doesn't pay to wait until after 70 to apply for Social Security. Uh, for someone whose FRA is 66 and they delayed to 70, you see their 
PIA, their, their benefit actually is going to be 132% of their PIA. On the far right, there you see the FRA for if you're, or for your FRA if it's 67, you see the different percentages there. When they reach 70 years of age, 124% of their PIA is what they would max out on delayed credits. So I'm guessing you're probably not too interested in calculating by hand either your AIME that we talked about or your PIA and the reductions and credits for early or late filing, the annual cost of living that you could get to raise your benefit. But there are ways you can kind of easily approximate those, those benefits you can expect to receive. And here you see some helpful links here. One, you can refer to your annual social security statement. These are now available online at socialsecurity.gov slash my statement. And you also need to set up an account and you can do that by answering some, so, some security questions there. And if you haven't set up an account yet, certainly suggest you do that. And the second thing is you can use the retirement estimator on the social security website. This calculator taps into your specific earnings history after you enter your personal identifying information, including your birth date, some other stats, you know, your social security number, mother's maiden name. Don't worry though, the site is secure. And please note that the, the annual statement and the retirement estimator, they don't factor in the cost of living adjustments into your age 70 benefit. This means your actual benefit is likely to be higher than what they might indicate. But the calculators we use here, they do adjust for the cost of living. So if you know your PIA, we can kind of help you project your future benefits. And that's part of what we'll do if you set up a meeting with us. We can certainly provide you a report that'll show some of the optimal filing scenarios in your situation. So you might want to try some calculators on the Social Security website, ssa.gov slash planner. You see the bottom one there, benefit calculators. Feel free to browse around the site and play with the calculators. Definitely a good starting point. And I'll just leave those up for a second. I want to take another swig. Yeah, if you're interested in those, definitely check them out if you haven't already. Okay, so the obvious advantage to delaying benefits is your monthly benefit is going to be higher. Uh, the chart here kind of spells that out for a person with a full retirement age of 67. So the second column here is looking at the percentage of the amount of reduction or the percentage of delayed credit uh, based on the filing age. So Somebody that's 67 at age 62 takes the 30% haircut, right? And that's a permanent reduction. But if they waited till 70, they get the 124% of the PIA. So here looking at a baby boomer has a primary insurance amount of $3,000 early would mean 2,100 if they're at age 62. But if they waited till 70, $3,720. That's looking at the third column there. And the difference even becomes more dramatic when you start to multiply the amounts by the cost of living adjustments, which they've done the 2% is what they've used here. So the age benefit, uh, the age 70 benefit here jumps up to $4,359. So certainly uh, you see the disparity when you really factor in the cost of living benefits. So it might be hard to pass up social security checks when you can first start receiving them as early as 62, but if you live a long time, you might be glad you waited. And as you can see, you know, the longer you live, the more income you're going to have that'll be waiting, you know, if you apply at age 70. So take a look at the disparity here as you go out further in time. So this looks at age 70, 75, 80, depending on when you claim that that second column is kind of estimating if you claimed early, you know, at age 85, $3,311 will be your monthly check. But if you delayed 5,866, there is kind of a break even point, certainly, which is part of the calculation. That's something we can help you out with as well. Okay, so naturally you're wondering, well, how can I maximize the benefits? And we're gonna look at a couple of strategies here. And I think the first thing you can do while you still have time is actually to improve your earnings record. Now, you can check your annual statement and make sure that your earnings record is accurate. Now, mistakes are rare there because the earnings that are on file at Social Security, they were reported by employers when, they're, when they've submitted your Social Security taxes. 
but mistakes can certainly happen, especially for self-employed in, individuals whose their earning, earnings records are actually taken from their tax returns. And the next thing to consider is you might be able to improve um, your earnings records. If you don't have 35 years of earnings, you could certainly work a few more years so that you won't be filled in with the zeros we talked about early. So if you have several years of maybe low earnings years early in your career, you can maybe work a few more years now while you're in your peak earnings years, and those would replace those low earning years. That's a pretty good one. Even if you start receiving Social Security but continue to work, your earnings record is actually going to be updated. But it is important to know that if you start receiving Social Security before reaching full retirement age, and if you earn over a certain amount each year, and it's $18,960 for this year, $1 of benefits is going to be withheld for every $2 that you earn over that threshold amount. All right, so applying for benefits at the optimal time is the best way to maximize your social security benefits. The chief reason for delaying benefits is because it's going to result in the highest lifetime benefit for you and your survivor. And of course, there's no certainly one size fits all answer here, but the important thing is to apply at the time that's certainly optimal for you. And that involves taking a close look at income needs now and in the future, certainly as some of those factors we mentioned before, life expectancy uh, for you and your spouse. Now, here's something a lot of people aren't aware of, and it may take you kind of by surprise. Did you know that Social Security benefits may be taxable? Yeah, let's look at maximizing benefits by minimizing your taxes. And so the first thing we're going to talk about here is actually the annual earnings test. And while the earnings test isn't really truly a tax, it is a way that the government takes back some of your income. So we're going to include it here. Uh, but it is different kind of from the true taxation of benefits, which we'll get onto next. But one important consideration in deciding when to apply for benefits is whether or not you plan to work. If you apply before you turn full retirement age, in 2021, this year, as I mentioned, $1 in benefits is going to be withheld for any time, anything you earn over that $18,960. Now, it's important to know that this money really isn't truly taken away. Rather, your benefit is going to be adjusted upward when you reach full retirement age to make it kind of mathematically as though you applied a little later. This means that if some of your benefits were withheld because you filed early and were working due to the earnings test, your new benefit would be higher as if you had started at you know, 63 or 65 instead of 62. But don't let the annual earnings test discourage you from working because again, the more money you earn, the more money you're gonna have. And social security doesn't necessarily penalize you for working. Once the adjustment is made, you're gonna end up with that higher benefit uh, for your life. And of course the earnings themselves are gonna contribute to your financial well-being. But to avoid that earnings test entirely, you just wait until your full retirement age or later to apply for benefits, the earnings test doesn't apply if you wait to file at FRA or later. All right, taxation of benefits. Now on to the true tax of Social Security benefits. This table shows the taxation of benefits based on various income levels. And income in this case means provisional income, and it's kind of defined on the bottom of the screen, but it includes your adjusted gross income plus one half of the social security benefit plus any tax exempt interest. So if provisional income is under 32,000 for a married couple looking at the top row there, uh, no benefits are subject to tax if it's under 32,000. If provisional income is between 32 and 44, up to 50% of a married couple's benefits are subject to tax. And if the provisional income is over, uh, there you see up to 85% of benefits are subject to tax. The thresholds there for a single individual, you see are 25,000, 25 to 34, and then over 34. Um, so important to know those, but the important thing to remember in all this is that, yeah, uh, eight, up to 85% of Social Security benefits may be subject to tax, depending on how much of provisional income you have. So you can minimize 
um, taxes on Social Security by lowering your other income, especially you know investment income. But you should be aware that municipal bond interest, which is usually tax free, that counts in that income for the purpose of calculating tax on Social Security benefits counts in that provisional income. So anticipate RMD, the required minimum distributions from your IRA, which may cause you to trip up to a higher tax bracket and may cause some of your Social Security benefits to be taxable. Consider drawing down some of your IRAs before 72 or converting those maybe into a Roth, which would generate some tax-free income. There's some strategies here. And then delaying claiming of Social Security will certainly reduce the number of years your benefits are subject to tax. And then, you know, think about ways to reduce your expenses, paying down debt and adopting a simpler lifestyle so you can make do with less income. And then continue to manage taxes throughout retirement, not just the first couple of years, right? And as always, you know, we, we advise you to consult your tax advisor for your individual situation. These are just possible ways that you can minimize taxes. All right, so remember that if you're over 65 and older and enrolled in Medicare, your Part B monthly premiums, they're gonna be deducted from your social security check. And as you can see here, if you claim early, your Medicare Part B will always eat up a larger percentage than if you waited until full retirement age to claim your social security benefits. So keep in mind, that Part B premium is means tested. So for higher income households, the amount listed here, that 148.50, which is this year's premium for Part B, it actually could be higher, in some cases, much higher. So the when to apply question, kind of very complex, really re requires some customized analysis, but a few points to remember. If you apply early, certainly your benefit starts out at some fraction of your PIA, 75%, 80%, whatever remaining at that percentage for the rest of your life. You lock in that permanent reduction, although you do get the cost of living adjustments. It doesn't go up to the 100% when you reach full retirement age. Cost of living adjustments do magnify the impact as we talked about the disparity between the delayed and those annual cost of living, certainly being applied to that lower number. If you took it early or a higher amount, it really starts to branch out and causes the disparity to the increase with each passing year. So your benefits may be taxed and then further reduced by Medicare premiums. And don't let the earnings test discourage you for working. It's you know, from working, it could actually be helpful for some folks. And then finally, delaying benefits uh, may give the surviving spouse more income. And that's certainly you know, an important point to consider because especially if you're thinking something like this. I'm not going to live long, so why shouldn't I just claim my benefit when I can? Typical answer to that question is this. For couples, you should always consider maximizing the higher earner's benefit to protect their surviving spouse who will then step into that benefit after the higher earner dies. So high earning spouses are therefore to encourage to delay their benefits to age 70, to kind of max that out because that's going to give their spouse the highest benefit after they die. And first, let's start by looking at how the spousal benefits even work. So Social Security was instituted in an obviously an earlier era where most married women did not work. And to give women uh, a measure of financial security in their old age, the program offered spousal benefits. Certainly important to note here that spousal benefits, the spousal benefits apply to either gender, including same-sex spouses now. So we use wives as an example here because this is kind of statistically the most common scenario we see, but certainly it can go many ways. The spousal benefit is 50% of the worker's PIA if she applies for it at her full retirement age. So if John's PIA in this example is $2,000 and Jane's PIA is 800, if Jane applies for social security at her full retirement age, her benefit will be equal to 50% of John's PIA or $1,000. This is $200 more than her benefit based on her own work record. That's the spousal benefit. So here are some basic rules around spousal benefits. The primary worker must have filed for benefits. The lower earning spouse must be at least 62 for a reduced benefit or full retirement age for the full spousal benefit. 
Spousal benefits don't earn the delayed credits after FRA. So I'm sure you have lots of questions about spousal benefits. So let's look at some of the ways you might consider to maximizing those. So the goal is to maximize income for the both of you while alive and maximize income for the survivor after one of you dies. And that can be quite complicated, but by understanding kind of all the considerations and doing the calculations, it is possible for married couples to come up with the right solution you know, for their needs. So let's take a look at a couple of strategies here. And the first one we're gonna look at is when you're coordinating the spousal benefits is this, is the lower earning spouses, the lower earning spouses PIA less than 50% of the higher earning spouses PIA. So if the lower earning spouses benefit is more than 50% of the higher earning spouses PIA, the way to maximize lifetime benefits is for both spouses to claim their benefit at 70. Our calculators kind of show that if both spouses have an average or longer than average life expectancy, that's gonna maximize the benefits for both of them over their lifetimes. Now then depending on the spouse's ages, one spouse may be able to claim a spousal benefit between the age of 66 and 70, but those rules have recently been changed if you were born before 1954, you may be able to claim a spousal benefit at age 66 while your own benefit builds up delayed credits to age 70. But we can talk to you about that and determine if you happen to be grandfathered in under those old rules. If so, it could mean quite a bit of dollars for you in extra benefits for you. So the other thing is this, if the lower earning spouse's PIA is less than 50% of the higher earning spouse's PIA, you may want to do what's called a hybrid strategy. Here, the lower earning spouse goes ahead and claims early. This gets income started as soon as the lower earning spouse turns 62 or whenever that spouse might stop working. The higher earning spouse still claims at 70 in order to maximize the higher benefit over both lifetimes. And again, we can help you determine the right strategy for coordinating spousal benefits. It can be complicated, especially given those rule changes we talked about, but you really need to kind of run the numbers and we can help you with that if, if need be. And so I want to remind you that, that we'd be happily to, happy to run really what's a series of scenarios. Uh, and we kind of run, like I said before, you know, five scenarios that may be best. And it's whether you're single, married, divorced, or widowed. And we can kind of continue as we look at even survivor benefits and not just, uh, just you know, focusing on one benefit, kind of trying to figure out what might be the maximizing situation, especially because some of you may be thinking, well, I'm already widowed or I'm divorced. So how does that affect my social security claiming strategy? Well, you know, widowed, divorced, and other folks, it's an interesting question with probably a surprising answer. You know, if you're widowed or divorced, you may be eligible for survivor benefits, divorced survivor benefits, or divorced spouse benefits. And by coordinating these benefits with your own record, you may be actually able to increase your total benefits. But first, let's look at kind of the basic survivor benefit a spouse would receive, hopefully after maximizing the other spouse's benefits. So survivor benefits can be somewhat complicated, but it's important to understand how they work because decis decisions that you make now can really influence the amount of the survivor benefit later on. So there are two factors that influence the amount of the survivor benefit. First factor is the age at which the deceased spouse claimed his or her own retirement benefit. So if he or she originally applied for Social Security before full retirement age, the survivor benefit is going to be limited to his or her actual benefit or 82.5% of the PIA, whichever is higher. If the deceased applied at his full retirement age, the survivor benefit will equal 100% of PIA. Now, if he or she applied at 70, the survivor benefit will include the delayed credits. And we'll see an example of that in just a moment. So the second factor in influencing um, the survivor benefit is the age 
at which the uh, widow or widower will claim the survivor benefit. So if he or she claimed at 60 or 50, as you see, if disabled, the survivor benefit will equal 71.5% of the descendant's PIA. If he or she claim at full retirement age or later, that survivor benefit is gonna be equal to 100% of the original amount. So they may apply anytime really between ages of 60 and 70 and the reduction or whatever is gonna be prorated in that case. So if both spouses are receiving benefits and one spouse dies, the other spouse may then switch to the higher benefit. And here's an example of that. So a hypothetical example, you see Joe, Joe and Julie, they're married and both are over full-time, uh, full retirement age and currently receiving benefits. So Julie's benefit is $2,000, Joe's is $1,200. If Julie dies, Joe's $1,200 benefit is going to stop and then he'll start receiving $2,000, kind of steps in to that survivor benefit. So one important note about survivor planning is the loss of actually one benefit. So most widows and widowers kind of need at least two thirds of the amount of income they were receiving as a couple. So it's important to plan for the loss of one spouse's social security benefit. Even though it is often a higher amount that, that is gonna be retained there, the death of a spouse actually does mean the loss of one social security check regardless. So, which means less money overall is gonna be coming into the household, but the survivor can step up to that higher benefit. So let's see what would happen if the deceased spouse had delayed the start of social security. In this hypothetical example, Julie here, she files for social security at age 70. So she, she maxed out her amount, amount there. Her benefit is 128% of her PIA of 2000. So her benefit is 2560. And now if she dies, Joe's survivor benefit will be equal to Julie's benefit of 2560. So survivor planning, definitely a very important part of social security planning. Decisions you make now can certainly influence the surviving spouse's standard of living later on in life. So here are rules for survivor benefits in order to receive that surviving benefit. Uh, the marriage must have lasted at least nine months unless the death is ruled an accident. And then to start benefits, the survivor must be at least age 60, as we said, or 50 if disabled. However, the widow or the widower applies before, if they apply before FRA, that benefit's gonna be reduced as is kind of the same for your regular retirement benefits. So some of the same principles that go into deciding when to apply for your regular retirement benefits also apply to survivor benefits. Now, if you remarry before age 60, you will not be able to receive a survivor benefit based on your previous spouse's earnings record unless your remarriage ends. And, you know, divorced spouse survivor benefits, they are available if the marriage lasted at least 10 years. And let's take a look at that uh, a little more because people obviously get divorced and it's kind of widely known or it's not a widely known benefit and understood. So let's jump into that in just a second. A divorced spouse can receive social security based on the ex-spouse's work record, providing that the marriage lasted at least 10 years and that the person receiving those benefits is currently unmarried. So remember, men, they can receive a divorced spouse benefit too. If the divorce occurred more than two years ago, the ex-spouse doesn't need to have filed for his or her benefit. However, that ex-spouse must be at least 62. So some more rules here for divorced spouse benefits. If more than one ex-spouse can receive benefits on the same worker's record, yeah, that's true. So if your ex-husband has been remarried a couple of times, essentially all three ex-wives could claim divorced spouse benefits as long as each marriage lasted at least 10 years. Uh, the benefits paid to one ex-spouse, they don't affect the benefits paid to the worker, the current spouse, or the other ex-spouses. You don't even need to know the ex-spouse's whereabouts, only enough information so that Social Security folks can look up his or her record. You'll also need uh, providing documentation to kind of show the dates of the marriage and the divorce. But you know, if you were receiving divorce spouse benefits and then you remarry, those divorce spouse benefits are gonna stop. 
However, you may be eligible for spousal benefits, different benefit, spousal benefits based on your new husband's work record, or you can switch to your own benefit, of course, if you qualify for social security. So some options there. And that probably has your head spinning, thinking, gosh, this is a little more complicated than I thought. And I get it. You know, I, I didn't realize a lot of this stuff before I started digging into it, but it really does kind of shine a light on the important role that social security can play into the retirement income plan, which brings us back to that original brain teaser. Remember that? So have you heard the phrase behavioral finance? It's kind of the study of the influence of psychology on the behavior of investors. So for our brain teaser question, people would usually say they'd rather be early than delayed for many things in life. And they'd rather get a bonus instead of paying a penalty. And you know, that makes sense, right? But as we've seen in our presentation, you know, when it comes to social security, early, is to penalty as delayed is to bonus. Now, the government didn't set up this phrasing intentionally that way, but it, it certainly has influenced people who have only seen their claiming choices described as early versus delayed. Now, we don't normally see the claiming question positioned as a penalty versus a bonus, but I think you can kind of see the value of framing the question in that manner. So I think this little brain teaser kind of a good way to loop back to the original problem and review kind of some of the things we discussed and then maybe discuss the solution. So here we go. So this is what we started with as our core challenge. People are hurting the retirements by making terrible costly decisions about social security. Then we went through four insights designed to help us get a real understanding of the problem and develop a brief solution and, and hopefully the solution that might work for you and here's what those insights were to this. Social security offers inflation protected income. You can't outlive, including survivor benefits. Your monthly benefit will be reduced if you claim early. Couples should always maximize, if they're able to, the higher earner's benefit for their surviving spouse. And if you're widowed or divorced, you may be eligible for benefits that can actually increase your check. So that understanding brings us to the solution that we feel everyone needs kind of a personalized social security claiming analysis to understand how and when to apply for their monthly benefit that really fits into the overall retirement income picture. Now it's important to consider social security in the context of your other retirement resources, you know, including, as you see here, pensions, IRAs, 401ks, the RMDs, you'll be needing to take at age 72, your overall investment portfolio and your plans for working in retirement. So all of these factors and resources can be considered and coordinated to give you kind of the picture of the income you're going to need for the rest of your life. So we urge you, please don't be afraid to ask for help. Retirement planning is easy, certainly when it's a matter of, you know, putting part of your salary into a 401k or an IRA. But when it comes time to convert that into an income stream, you know, you want to make sure that that income stream doesn't run out. And Social Security, as we mentioned, can kind of be the bedrock or base of that income retirement plan. But it must be, you know, we feel coordinated with really everything else so that you really have the stability and security that you deserve. So what can Social Security personnel do? Well, they're very helpful, by the way. And, and but the thing they can't do is make recommendations. It's not their job to do really the long range social security planning because they really don't know what's going on with the rest of the pieces of your personal finances. But we can, however, help you analyze some of those claiming strategies, show you some social security income stream under different claiming scenarios and help you kind of take advantage of maybe some strategies that, that would be designed to maximize your benefits. So, We've covered a lot of territory today, and you probably still have questions among them. Hey, when should I apply for Social Security? Uh, what if you want to keep working? What if you've applied already? You know, and how much will my benefit be? How can I coordinate the spousal benefit? What's my best long-term strategy? You know, for my situation, and really, what should I do next? Well, we'd certainly be glad to help you consider those, or if you have another financial professional you're working with, those are great questions to ask. And we want to help you 
definitely come up with a personal situation for you if we can. So social security is too important for, for guesswork as we've shown. So let's kind of help protect that nest egg and maximize your retirement income. The best way we can do that, as we mentioned, is kind of you know run these customized reports, whether you're single, married, divorced, widowed, whatever. If you're interested in doing that, we ask you to reach out to us via email at info at horizonfg.com so that we can just set up a meeting with one of our advisors. We can send out a pre-meeting questionnaire that will kind of get us prepared to run those different scenarios that might be optimal for your situation. So again, send us an email here to info at horizonfg.com if you're interested in that in that analysis. Also, we're going to be following up this webinar via email to offer you Remember a copy of this six page resource called a baby boomers guide to social security. This piece does a great job of summarizing everything we talked about today. If you'd like a copy of that, just reach out to us with your address, we'll mail it. But also remember, if you'd like to download, we have a scan version in the chat section right now. You can go to chat and you'll see it there at the top of the chat and just download that PDF if you'd like. But again, info at horizonfg.com if you'd like to meet or discuss your situation any further. That's going to about wrap things up for us for today's presentation. Certainly, you know, uh, appreciate you taking time out to be with us. Again, questions, send them to info at horizonfg.com. We'll get back to you very, very quickly. Quick reminder about some of the other topics we're going to be covering in August. On the 26th, we're going to present keys to making a family caregiving plan. If you have elderly parents, that might be something to check in on. In September, managing healthcare expenses. Talk a lot about Medicare. And then new retirement rules. There's a lot being discussed on Capitol Hill right now in terms of reform as it comes to retirement accounts. If anything's settled by then, we'll certainly include that in the discussion. But information and registration for those events is going to be coming out very shortly. You can check on our website at horizonfg.com slash events for more information. Also, by the way, today's webinar is being recorded and we're gonna post it to that same site, the Horizon site events in a couple of days. So also invite you to check out last month's webinar we did, which was on legacy and estate planning. That's a very important piece too, as you start thinking about retirement. That recording on the events page as well. So we hope to see you for one or more of those upcoming presentations. That's going to wrap it up for today. We appreciate you joining us. Hope to see you next time. We're going to keep the meeting up just for another minute or two in case you need to access the file that's in the chat. But until next time, so long. We'll see you later.